the first session for today is Unpacking State Capability for Social Policy, Planning, and Economy, Lessons from India and the World. India's weak state capacity is a well-recognized problem. Yet, attempts at addressing the deep and urgent challenges of building state capacity are often defeated by, by an equally strong sense of disillusionment in the Indian state. As a result, our approaches to state capacity incre increasingly turn to techno-managerial fixes, plumbing solutions, and outsourcing and bypass. Hosted in partnership with the Meghalaya State Capability Forum, this panel unpacks the challenges and possibilities of building state capabilities for social policy, planning, and the economy in diverse, democratic, and federal India. Our panelists for this session are Sampat Kumar, Principal Secretary and Development Commissioner, Meghalaya, Mihail, Mihail Rutkowski, Global Director, and social, Global Director of Social Protection and Jobs World Bank, Parmeshwaran Ayer, Chief Executive Officer, Niti Aayog, Government of India. And the session is moderated by Yamini Ayer, President and Chief Executive of CPR, and Mekhla Krishnamurti, Senior Fellow at the State Capacity Initiative at CPR. Mekhla, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, and a very good morning to all of you. Um, it's, you know, it's been a complete privilege for me to have a chance to contribute to building the State Capacity Initiative at CPR over the last you know, three years. Um, and you will notice that we use, well, the initiative is the State Capacity Initiative. The panel title is State Capability. We are going to use it somewhat controversially to the few nerds who pay attention to the state capability debates interchangeably. Uh, there are people with a great amount of, you know, who believe this is not a semantic distinction, capacity and capability. They are probably right, but we are going to use it interchangeably nonetheless. So just you'll see us moving between the two. Um, <clears throat> and so on behalf of CPR and its State Cap Capacity Initiative and the Meghalaya State Capability Forum, <laughs> Uh, I very warmly welcome you uh, to this panel. Um, we, you know, we've been referring a little bit to this, the last CPR dialogues, which were in March 2020, because it was just such a significant, like, chronological moment. But it was quite a significant moment for the State Capacity Initiative because that was when we were formally launched um, with a panel on thinking about what would it take to build, I think even then we use state capability um, as well for a 21st century Indian state, but also for the Indian state in the 21st century. Again, not just semantic, because when we say 21st century Indian state, people think we're talking about the technology state. And when we say the state in the 21st century, we realize, as we did with COVID, that we are talking about people. We are talking about a large number of people who suddenly sort of became, uh, Great, our, uh, wonderful. our third panelist is here, and we can then go straight into the panel. So I will be brief. Um, but I think it has also given us an opportunity to really reflect on what has happened over the last two and a half years. And I think, you know, we sometimes joke that those of us who talk about the nitty gritty questions of state capacity are often you know, at the end of a conversation, it's the afterthought of the conversation on implementation. It's, you know, a small group of people who actually sit and then talk about institutional design, capacities of individuals. Um, after all, the big policy framing and thinking has happened. Um, but I think COVID really changed that. It brought to the fore the importance of state capacity. Um, it brought to the center the people of the state. Uh, but also, as we discussed yesterday, lifelines like the PDF, um, MNRG, Narega, um, the you know, health system, which had to be mobilized at all levels. And it was clear both what we managed to do and what we didn't. Um, education, where we've seen across states, and we'll discuss further in Andhra Pradesh and other states, where more students are going back to the public system and to public education today. So it, it really was very profound. And as I think we discussed through the day yesterday, the role of the state in the economy 
um, I think was just became so palpable. So the question I think that came up in the keynote that we thought markets could run things and then suddenly it is now this recentering of the state. So the conversation actually for us is very different. Uh, we don't have to make a case in some senses for state capacity anymore. But one of the things we find quite remarkable in these years of building this initiative is that while everybody agrees that state capacity is incredibly important, and I think in so many panels yesterday, whether it was pollution control boards um, or other institutions, regulators, we were talking about this. But as soon as you get to the second level of the conversation, you discover the actual faith in the state is rather low in terms of your actual ability to change or build state capacity, what you see is, on the one hand, still a sort of some imagination of control that you can direct things, or a quite palpable disenchantment, a lack of trust, something that was again discussed quite a bit yesterday. Um, and you hear the usual response. I think that you know, there's a political economy, that there is no political will, something we heard, I think, from the morning to the evening with air pollution and with many other things that where is the political will. Um, and we also hear a thing or two in a room full of many bureaucrats about bureaucratic wherewithal, uh, about their territorialism, about their, you know, not ceding enough ground, about the control and, and the kind of ways in which they, um, you know, restrict certain kinds of reform. And as a result, what you overwhelmingly hear um, is that if you want to reform something, you have to recourse to bypass or some kind of workaround or some kind of technological fix that will solve the problem of you know, these people. And so while I think discretion is a hugely important issue, it dominates our understanding of how we are to build state capacity in some ways without taking the people of the state and the people we have right there along. Like how can we do it? by actually bypassing. And I think for us, um, I think this is a moment where too much discussion on reform by stealth as a very successful model for reform, or of bypass, or of outsourcing, um, is insufficient to say the least. In some cases, it may be misguided, and we have to refocus on the, the people, the processes, and the public institutions. So over the last few, you know, couple of years, and, and COVID gave us an opportunity to do some of this alongside the government's own focus, the central government and in states, uh, the focus on people. So there was Mission Karma Yogi, which has been launched. I think several state governments have really focused on um, how to build their own capacities. So picking up on that, we have spent uh, some time, um, you know, looking at the people of the state across the levels. So starting with the higher civil services, um, we have managed to do two rounds of a very interesting survey with IAS officers. Deepak Sanan is here, who was our collaborator on this. You know, we managed to survey a 1,000 IAS officers. And interestingly, IAS officers, for everything else they do, don't like to be surveyed. So we were very happy to get such a great response. Um, but actually trying to understand norms and values, trying to understand decision making response in crisis. Um, and, and then we also looked at a history of administrative reforms, looking at critical questions again of selection, of training, of performance, um, you know, and, and promotion, and, and thinking about how the core reform debates can be reshaped today. Um, we have spent quite a lot of time, I think COVID was an interesting moment where the frontline state actually became so prominent. For the first time, they were given a name. They were called frontline workers and were acknowledged. Um, and so we spent a lot of time looking at the history of policy with the frontline state, but also the dynamics of the frontline across a whole range of workers, um, including mapping the frontline state and looking and understanding their, you know, the response during COVID. Um, we have also managed to, as you saw yesterday, focus on regulators and regulatory capacity, um, you know, really looking at regulators as people. So the Know Your Regulator series was really to have an interaction with the people who run our regulatory agencies. And we've done, you know, a very successful series of talks which have been really rich uh, and intricate. So these are the sort of range of uh, pieces that we've worked on. We've also centered you know, institutions. Um, with Meghalaya, we have had an opportunity to really look closely at the administrative training institutes. We are looking at particular kinds of regulatory bodies and the institutions of cooperative federalism. 
Um, and, and now looking closely at the parts and functions and agencies that look at human resource management in the state as well. Um, with the frontline state and in a partnership with Andhra Pradesh, which we'll hear more about in the next session, also a chance to look at what it takes to staff and capacity at the frontline state, but also the relationship between data, you know, analytics, data analytics, and the actual infrastructures of implementation, both human um, and material. So these are some of the things we've done. It has been a huge amount of learning. And in many ways, we just could not have done it unless we had found partners within governments uh, to work with us and to teach, to learn with. And that is actually one of the reasons we're so proud to be you know, hosting, co-hosting this panel with the Meghalaya State Capability Forum. Because among states that we met, you know, this was a state where we did not begin a conversation with a dashboard. We began a conversation about people. We began a conversation about thinking about what we're going to do, and therefore dashboards do come into the picture, but in a completely different way. Um, and so I've really, um, it's been a privilege for us to work with Meghalaya. We've worked on a number of projects now um, across thinking about um, different elements from, as I said, the Administrative Training Institute to health, um, and looking deeply at the dynamics of new institutions like village education council, uh, village employment councils, and village health councils, so I'm really very honoured to have um, you know Meghalaya here today. Uh, it is a forum that um, is hosted by the Chief Minister, um, and I think the first Meghalaya State Capability Forum was on purpose and government, uh, thinking about public purpose, recentering purpose. Um, you know, with Professor Land Pritchett, who was was also uh, a senior visiting fellow at CPR. So it is a real privilege um, to, to do that, to have this forum, and to co-host it today. Um, really looking forward to everybody's comments and feedbacks. I hope you will engage with our work, uh, which we will share um, through all of CPR's many channels and our comms team, but really looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much. So now, may I invite all of uh, our panelists to come to the stage, please. And then I think we'll start with Mr. Sampat Kumar, who will give us a presentation. So please. Good morning to all of you. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Yamini ji uh, and Dr. Mekhala for uh, giving this opportunity to the state of Meghalaya uh, to host this panel. Uh, I, uh, I would like to say that, you know, uh, this uh, panel supposed to have been attended by our Honorable Chief Minister too. But unfortunately, you know, uh, he couldn't attend. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, you know, um, uh, we will definitely share some of his vision in this particular uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, I, uh, the, uh, I think this is the outline that uh, I would like to use to present about uh, the kind of a work that we have been doing in the state of Meghalaya and uh, our learnings and uh, our insights and also we also wanted to we are excited to share a particular small framework maybe that may be useful for the you know discussion here so that's uh, a kind of an institutional model for state capability the uh, essentially when we talk about the state capability we, we are talking about how state capability is important for addressing some of the complex development problems. So essentially focusing on the uh, how actually we are addressing those complex problems, for example, complex problems is like I, I would like to share uh, for Meghalaya, it is a maternal deaths. We are, uh, we are a matrilineal society. 85% of the population is indigenous population. Despite of that, we have a high maternal mortality. So how, uh, you know, it's a kind of a, you know, to understand that one. So the, uh, I, the core guiding principle of building state capability is to build a sense of purpose, you know, uh, along with uh, capabilities to identify and solve the problems that matter. And we, to achieve that one, you know, we work at uh, multiple levels. So one at a state leadership level, which actually Dr. Mekala was mentioning about the political will and political supportability, how actually is important to you know work at state leadership level, and then number two, how actually important is to work you know to work at the state organizations, how actually to different departments, different agencies working for solving those problems, and the third is the citizens and communities. So here, I would like to 
put this, uh, 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 how the state capability is, you know, in terms of uh, to address these complex development problems, at a, at a low capability level, you know, you, you would find uh, 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 this uh, most of the time, you know, we, 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 even in Meghalaya. So essentially, you know, at a uh, state level, we see is that there is a lack of strategy or, you know, our purpose or the clarity of purpose. Essentially, you know, more like an implementer, you know, it's a kind of a, you receive instructions and, you know, and, uh, and then passes those instructions to the districts and uh, without tailoring to the local needs. So from there to how actually we can, you know, bring a high capability by clarifying the purpose and nurturing the leaders at a, every level, identifying and ad, you know, addressing systemic challenges because every state has a systemic challenge. You know, we, as I mentioned, uh, uh, about the maternal uh, uh, deaths that about the Meghalaya, the systemic challenge. In fact, it's a, it's a matrilineal society. Everyone thinks that there is a gender is not at all an issue, but gender is an issue. So addressing those issues and identifying those issues and addressing those systemic challenges are very, very important, uh, especially for the state leadership. Then state organizations, you know, uh, uh, mostly we look at most of the departments like, you know, checking the box, you know, where, you know, uh, we are using this interesting phrase, compliant, uh, you know, without purpose, like a post office states, you know, where you, you, you comply it, you know, you have done this one, but that's it. And these are the results uh, that we are getting. And uh, basically, the idea is it more like an input-driven focus on implementing schemes, but not solving problems. You know, from there, how actually we can see that we can create a learning organization, purpose-driven organizations. So that's uh, again how actually uh, we can you know uh, build these state organizations to solve the problems. So that's where the work you know towards the state capability has to go. Then the third aspect, third level, which is also very important. Often the states they work mostly on the supply side interventions okay so whether uh, you know it's a more like we are providing like uh, there is a there is a uh, very little you know uh, or very less attention on the demand side problems like how to engage people how actually so how to actively mobilize that demand side piece is also very very important in terms of the state capability so so this uh, uh, we are, you know we and these are the challenges and you know we have been trying to you know do things differently uh, by designing you know at a local level we have designed a project and uh, initially we started with rural development what we did was the a small team of officials at the state level you know uh, they uh, basically they started actually understanding how actually we can you know transform the rural development in the state of meghalaya so the idea what uh, they did was they started actually understanding what kind of an opportunities that what we have. So the initially when we looked at when the when the initiative started the uh, the the rural employment guarantee program the biggest program was uh, having only 270 crore rupees was the budget of the state. And whereas you know there are many villages which were not really leveraging this particular program. So so the again by mobilizing the block level village level leadership by you know doing like a, visiting each and every block you know and a, uh, a, a a kind of a very intensive effort but that effort led to you know the 270 crore organization today it is about 1600 crore organization so what i would like to say is that uh, they uh, there is a a kind of a, you know the districts where we used to have the militancy problems you know are uh, you know they are actually quite engaged with the work what they are doing now so there is a uh, this is a kind of a, a picture that I have been showing. This is the where the the uh, you know the innovations have come up. Like where people started, uh, Meghalaya has a huge geographical challenge, so people started coming up with using their own resources. They have this uh, uh, you know rural employment guarantee program. So all the villages have come together in innovation, and they started building this kind of an iconic projects where actually re, you know connecting to the unreached villages. So this is one example, and uh, based on that experience, what we understood is that we have a huge, huge human resources in the state. In fact, this was also shared with the 15th Finance Commission, uh, where uh, uh, we said uh, the states uh, spend uh, quite a bit of a money on salary and pensions of the human resource engaged by the state, almost like close to 50%. 
So how actually we can really leverage this human resources? So the, the example that what I have shown, how actually we can uh, you know, live, you know, bring that intrinsic motivation and then you know, convert that into an opportunity. So this, this uh, in a, besides that, we also have been using this, uh, uh, we are inspired by these three uh, frameworks that actually for the state capability, problem-driven iterative adaptation approach, it's a very interesting approach. Uh, and similarly, adaptive leadership uh, framework, especially giving work back to the people and see that like how actually they can find local solutions to the local problems. And we also have been inspired by the mission economy. So this is something that we wanted to say, you know, especially the governments have a lot of capacity to envision uh, for a transformative agenda. In fact, when our chief minister started saying that, like, you know, we should, we are actually under the bottom five of the states currently. So how actually we can get into the top uh, five, top ten states uh, in the next you know, 10 years. So a kind of a, a, a government should envision a transformative agenda and if that is done, then, you know, we can actually channelize the resources and the processes accordingly. So based on this, we also have come up with this six, you know, I think uh, pillars, I would say, are the core principles of the state capability. So the importance of like in building leadership at all levels through increased agency to solve problems. So this is so important because why this is important? Because most of the time in the states, people look at the you know, central authority for solutions. How actually we can change that entire approach? You know, how actually we can promote the distributed leadership? So that's one important uh, principle, are we actually promoting that leadership at all levels? Are we promoting that distributed, decentralized leadership? And then we also need to require a lot of strengthening the teamwork and the citizen-state relationship. There is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, work is required within the states because uh, people work in silos. How actually to bring them as a teamwork, you know, this is something, you know, it's again, it, it requires a political level supportability to ensure that when, how actually the teamwork can happen, how actually we can build that citizen-state relationships, how actually we are creating that entire connect, especially to generate the demand, uh, you know, from the people side then effective use of data and you know and uh, learn and adapt and accountability for outcomes not for just like you know accountability for inputs but uh, and also political supportability for systemic changes and institutionalizing the successful practices a kind of a six pillar framework that we have designed so how actually we used this for the maternal uh, you know death issues, you know, maternal, uh, you know, mortality rate issue in the state. So you, as I said, like, you know, there's a, uh, just a picture here, but this is the picture, like, you know, you can say almost like 60% of the state uh, is like this. So it's a huge uh, uh, geographical challenges. So if you look at the, when we started, you know, when, when we started this maternal death uh, analysis so before, like, before, you know, you know, with, without this approach, generally the we used to do the maternal death analysis not like this. How many people died because of postpartum hemorrhage? How many people died because of so? So it's not the analysis was not really understanding the source of the problem. It was only you know analysis was only to understand the symptom of the problem. So when we started, you know. Uh, getting these discussions and these these ideas you know have come up mostly from again from the local leadership so if you can see uh, the 87% uh, had low birth spacing so that means the the women who give birth to the babies you know if there is no uh, spacing proper spacing of 1000 days you know the uterus is no longer you know you know allows her to give another birth so in the process actually there is a ruptured uterus and you know there is there is there can be a death so so basically why this has happened because women has taken a gender role that like you know our role is this so again a gender now so though it's a matrilineal society, but there is a deep social issues, how actually we can change those things. It's a, then uh, the, this, this I just wanted to show you like how we were done this uh, at a, uh, the challenge was initially the kind of a default notions. You know, this is something is a very difficult problem in our state because it's very difficult because it's a deep rooted, you can't even sp speak about uh, family planning, uh, you know, uh, measures. You cannot actually, the, there is a serious issue because uh, even if you go by the medical terminology, like you see that uh, you require to, you know, transport a mother after experiencing a labor pain within 30 minutes to the 
nearest uh, you know health facility but we have as i said more than 60% of the villages cannot come within 30 minutes it will take hours so how that is possible and there, there is a uh, so they, here actually we started talking about you know state leaders you know oriented to the you know at a, especially at the districts and the blocks at the medical level at the sector level especially about the purpose of stopping maternal deaths and highlighted the positive deviance cases to show it is possible and provided an you know increased agency especially authorization this is something that is very very important i am using this authorization because this is something as a very important uh, especially within the government people look for authorization they don't they don't take decisions on their own so authorization is a very very important process so authorizing them that you know you can take decisions you can actually you know you know uh, find solutions that are appropriate to your place then the sec second thing like you know strengthening the team work and citizen state relationship so there is a no connection between different departments i think you must have discussed yesterday also yeah, as uh, dr michael was saying so there is a limited uh, connection between the community and the state and the there is a uh, yeah okay so <laughs> so we, we so basically what we did was we brought all the core departments thank you we brought all the core departments together to jo the joint uh, you know reviews and this is something was very interesting actually we have in our state every week this in depth uh, reviews happen with all the departments understanding what is the problem so this is a another very important thing and we also brought a concept like you know to build this citizen state relationships a kind of a field visits is a very very important thing in fact if you i'm putting a quote from the land pritchett you know this uh, connective tissues is a very important you know uh, to reach all levels you know especially about when we talk about the policy implementation so this is so important just like i, I would like to show this photo <laughs> so <laughs> why what is this uh, you know connected tissues you know this this this, this is so important i think this is a success in our uh, you know uh, you know i think the whole not only india whole world would proud of the work that has happened in india so it's it it is you know if you have an imagination and if you can actually share that shared purpose with at every level you know that is possible so uh, th this i think uh, for adam tools i think i should tell you this is a uh, a toilet you know actually yeah 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 so, okay so okay <laughs> so basically to demonstrate that like you know this is something that you know once it is dried it's like any other soil you know just like to remove that kind of a sense of you know stigma yeah. so there is a then addressing the you know as i said like you know how we used a uh, you know uh, app you know the essentially data we have we collect the data but we don't use the data so today you know if in our state if you ask any an any medical officer any med bdo any dc they will say in next 14 days how many high risk pregnant mothers are there where they are they should be brought to the facility at least 10 days before the expected date of delivery so that kind of usage of data is very very important so we put that kind of a then of course accountability for outcomes we brought one interesting concept again through political supportability we brought you know like a school districts concept in us we brought health districts village health councils elected bodies so so at some point of a time people want to go in to live in a village because that village has got good health outcomes so it's a kind of an interesting concept that we are bringing and of course as i said we we have you know we deliberately you know every involve uh, the especially the political leadership uh, to see that how this work is more exciting than just building constructing roads and you know other works this is something that's a very very important thing when we started this in 8 months we were 34 rank in the full immunization child immunization in the country and we in 8 months we were number 2 in the country so when we show these results you know you also get a lot of political supportability that actually led to you know greater resources today we are number 4 in terms of healthcare expenditure in the country so it's a uh, it's again an importance of political supportability and institutionalizing the best practices like i am coming back these are some results uh, like just i want to show and but the real thing just i i'll just like a, a model this is the kind of a thing that we would like to you know just leave it uh, to the to share with others you know states see we found the these are the three things you know are required to institutionalize state capability in any state or maybe further to, or to address any other uh, complex developmental problems you require authorizers you require some champions we require facilitators who are the authorizers authorizers can be the chief ministers or the senior of officials you know mostly the ias officials in this in this country and uh, champions 
you know, champions can be the most of them as state leadership. You look at state civil service officers and, you know, directors and you're different. And, and we have the facilitators. So if we have these three, a group of combination, I think we can really, you know, bring the state capability and institutionalize this model. And the last question just I would like to leave is that, like, how to make building state capability a more central agenda for states? Because it is a very low cost intervention because resources are already there. It's only, you know, turning that passive, you know, the human workforce into an active workforce with a greater sense of purpose and with a greater sense of urgency. And this is something that can be done because, you, you know, uh, and then second is that like how, uh, the second question I think is very, very interesting, who can identify effective authorizers, so maybe Niti Aayog or Capacity Building Commission, champions and, you know, facilitators. What entities can provide facilitating support? For example, for Jaypal, MIT is providing a facilitating support for the facilitators. Can, can there be any other MIT kind of an organization to provide that facilitating support? Then how can multilateral organizations can make a room for greater flexibility? So, so these are, uh, you know, some things that questions that I would like to leave it for the dialogue. And thank you. I think I'm extended my time. Sorry. Thank you, Sampat. This was absolutely fantastic. And, and in fact, you've done the moderator's job by laying out those, uh, the, 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 the most critical questions that we should be discussing. But I think what's been so exciting, as Mekla mentioned, for, uh, the, uh, for this entire journey that we've had uh, with the state of Meghalaya is that the starting point of the discussion uh, was very much about uh, identifying purpose of the state and strengthening people of the state. And Param, I want to start with you, uh, I know we were going to talk about states, but there's something in uh, Sampath's uh, presentation that was too tempting uh, for me not to pick up in conversation with you. Um, uh, Sampath talks about purpose and links purpose to mission economy. If there's one person in the Indian bureaucracy who's identified purpose and linked it to mission in, in, in your previous avatar uh, in the Swachh Bharat mission, it is you. Um, but I want to provoke you uh, to push this a little bit. Uh, very often when we talk about the Indian state, uh, we talk about it in its ability to drive itself and align itself very effective, effectively to purpose in mission mode. The problem is when you have to translate that mission and routinize it into the everyday. Uh, so I just wanted your comments on that because I think one of the challenges when we talk about purpose and mission is that the discourse on state cap capacity then becomes, let's enter into mission mode, lots of things happen, and you find the champions, the authorizers, and the facilitators in that mission. What happens after? So your thoughts on that just to kick us off. Well, thanks, Yamini, and actually great to be here to see so many friends uh, and colleagues in the audience and on the dais. Uh, you know, we referred to Lant and his famous definition at that time of India being a flailing state. I think it's come a long way since then. And uh, you spoke about mission mode and how do you get into sort of steady state. Uh, so in this Swaj Bharat mission, clearly we were in campaign mode for most of the time. And, you know, it was all about galvanizing people and getting states on board and getting the, the sort of entire... I'm from the UP cadre. We like to use the model of the PM, CM, DM model. So kind of aligning that, uh, that particular axis. So, and you know, as someone once said, you can, you sort of, in elections, you campaign in poetry, but you govern in prose. So day to day, how do you sustain all that? And, and that's why I think capacity is really critical in all the good work which Sampath and others have done in Meghalaya. So what we try to do uh, in this Swaj Bharat mission, and of course it's very challenging, because you know there's a, a sort of milestone to reach October 2nd, 2019, but then you have to start planning beyond that. And I was reminded of that uh, when Cass Sunstein came and visited us around 2018. And he reminded me that in America it took, he said 10 to 15 years for people to actually get used to wearing seat belts. You know, it was very new in the 70s. So he reminded us that you've really got to plan for sustaining all this momentum. And then we started this program, we called it, you know, Swat Bharat Phase 2, we planned for that, where they would continue the focus on behavior change, on what are the incentives, what are the mechanisms to continue in steady state to sustain that change behavior. So it's, it's, it was very challenging, we had to continue doing it. And uh, 
One of the mechanisms which we followed was actually uh, good to see Pratap in the audience. I'd gone to meet Pratap once and, and you know, he was quite critical about the program and so I went and had a dosa with him in your office. And so uh, we started talking about the program and he said, listen, all this talk of behavior change is good stuff, but what are you actually doing on the ground to shift that behavior? So we spoke about the sort of stormtroopers on the ground. Uh, the prime minister gave it a great name, the Swacha Grahis. And he said, if you can actually activate a village motivator across the country, 600,000, then you've got a reasonably credible story to tell. So those Swacha Grahis, they're from their locals. They were trained in behavior change. And many of them are still there. Of course, you know, uh, COVID happened and et cetera. So I think that you've got to really build that capacity all the way down if you want to sustain any kind of mission mode initiative. And I can talk a little bit about Niti, but maybe that's another question of what we are currently doing and of course working with states, all the points you mentioned, but I'll come back to that. <clears throat> Let me just stay with the mission mode point for a, for a moment and we'll, we'll, we'll then come to, uh, to actually purpose and, 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 and states um, in, in terms of the state transformation is also an important issue that we'll get to in a moment. But one of the challenges um, with the mission mode framing uh, is does it risk over centralization? And how do you build capacity? So a mission, by definition, involves a set of targets that are coming from the top. You can identify or build a set of people on the ground, uh, but does it risk uh, people responding to targets from the top rather than people developing a sense of purpose from the bottom up? Your thoughts on that? No, I think there is a risk. And uh, look, it, but it's a risk you've got to take because I think that this is a, a sort of a combination of a top-down and a bottom-up approach. So for example, now, you know, the Prime Minister has spoken about a $5 trillion economy, and clearly it's got to be an inclusive uh, economy. But the challenge for us in Niti is how do you get the states, how do you get the subnational? You know, they've got to play a key role in this, right? It's the states who are going to deliver, as you've been talking about. So. So what we have started doing now is uh, we have started a state support mission in Niti where we have reached out to all states again and how do you get them to develop their own vision? And a lot of them are on the move, right? Meghalaya are clearly in many ways leading, but even other states where, and again, it's about political leadership we heard today. So there are lots of states where chief ministers in particular, and this cuts across the political divide, they are very interested in sort of taking their state to another level. And typically it's defined in terms of, you know, whether it's Maharashtra says we want to become a $1 trillion economy by 2030, UP says 27, uh, Assam, Chhattisgarh. So what we are right now doing, it's critical to get them on board. It's their vision. You can sort of articulate a sort of macro vision at the national level, but in then it's the states which need to deliver. So in our state support mission, which Shekhar Bonu is helping us to lead, and we've got a good team, so what we are doing is we're looking at five different aspects, again, coming from the states. So the first is how do they articulate, can they be helped or have they already developed, can they articulate what's the goal in terms of an inclusive growth strategy? Then the second is how, what is the strategy to achieve that goal? Because right now, as you mentioned, there are a lot of dashboards and there are a lot of consultants. So how, what is the strategy to do that? It's got to be integrated, it's got to be socio-economic, it's not just also, not just the social sector, but how do you raise resources? So what is your asset monetization strategy, uh, you know, for your infrastructure needs? The third is what is that institution which is going to help drive that transformation? So a lot of the states, so the question for us was a lot of, Niti became Niti seven years ago, but many states are still in kind of planning mode. So if you're talking of development strategy now, what is the institution? A lot of them, so now Meghalaya has done it, Assam has set up the State Institute for Transforming Assam, UP is thinking of something called SITUP, State Institute for Transforming UP. <laughs> so that's a clever name. Maharashtra has got Mitra. So a lot of them, and it shouldn't just be a, a name change. So then, so what's the capacity of the institute to drive the change, uh, which is key? So we are thinking now of work, we're working with 10 to 12 states. We want to help embed capacity, but work with the IIMs and the IIT so that there's some institutional connections in a three-way partnerships. And then I think very importantly, the knowledge transfer. 
So what, how can Meghalaya teach other states? So we have set up a team, we are embarking on this and it's going to be very challenging. The idea is to reach all the states. But I think your point uh, would like to re-emphasize, it's got to come from the states and it can't be some top-down vision. We've got to work together. Uh, this dialectic of centralization, decentralization, the inherent tensions in that, the interplay between them, um, it's, it's a very real phenomenon in the, uh, in the context of India, especially when we talk about state capacity and uh, the, the role that these mission modes play in mobilizing capacity, even if for brief periods. But I don't think it's unique to India. There's a lot that we can learn uh, from around the world. So I wanted to bring you in just to give us a global perspective on, on some of these tensions um, and how they've played out. Thank you very much, Yamini, and thanks very much to the CPR for inviting me to this wonderful event. Always a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll be talking about social protection primarily, but very much about the issues you are discussing here. And as a starting point, I really like what uh, Sampat started with, talking about building a sense of purpose. And it is very often a missing link in social protection policies, because what you have on the ground, you have multiplicity of programs everywhere, partially overlapping, excluding the population, parts of the population. And the first question that comes to mind is, what is the sense of purpose for all those programs taken together? And when you want to deliver on your sense of purpose, you need to have some kind of a policy or strategy. What we have been observing uh, worldwide is, I give you a few numbers because I think they are telling, between 2009 and 2013, average 12 countries per year were actually coming up with social protection policies at the level of the, of the country. And that continued, so, so the number of countries with social protection frameworks actually grew from 19 to 67 between 2009 and 2013, the pace uh, went further and now we have 98 countries like that. So the first question needs to be added in, in these social protection policies at the state level or at the federal level, is there an overarching framework? Is this a sense of where we are going, some sense of, of quo vadis? Um, and in that context, let me, and, and in, the sense of Indi, in, the, in the context of India, I think it's a very good question because uh, you need that formulation of social policy at the level of the state. It doesn't make any sense that Bihar has the same policies in social protection as Delhi. They has got to be different and there's got to be a process of working out strategies at the state level. Now, in social protection, when one says working out strategies, what does that really mean? So I want to offer you a certain framework of thinking about it. Uh, what does that mean? And I, I, I suggest that we think about taking all those programs as together being in a position to fill four different gaps. The first is a coverage gap. The second is an opportunity gap. The third is a flexibility gap. And finally, last but not least, is a financing gap. And uh, I think it is quite intuitive what I mean, because it shows four different challenges for social protection. First is to cover all who need social protection. The coverage gap worldwide is enormous. Among poorest 20% in the world, less than one-fifth of those people who are in bottom 20% gets any social protection program. So coverage gap is a huge challenge. Um, the opportunity gap is how to link those recipients of social protection to value chains, to livelihoods, to some activation, what we call graduation or economic inclusion, or at the higher income level, active and passive labor market policies. So the opportunity gap is the third one. Flexibility gap was so clearly shown in COVID. You need systems that can react very quickly to quickly changing circumstances, expand and shrink. And ability to do that is absolutely fundamental in the world where the number and severity of shocks, 
both man-made and natural is going to grow. We actually have seen, if there is a very strong evidence, it has been growing before COVID. With COVID and the effects of war in Ukraine, I think it, it is almost intuitive now to say that. And finally, financing gap is very obvious. You may have all the three other gaps closed, but if you cannot finance programs, then you have a problem. And the agenda for financing is enormous, ranging from what you do with subsidies, how you convert them into targeted social protection programs, uh, how you cover the informal sector with social insurance if you cannot have a mandate uh, because you cannot mandate social security contributions from the informal sector. So you can try to expand formal systems, but then you also need to incentivize voluntary contributions against various risks. Anyway, so we have those four different, uh, four different uh, gaps. And it's always useful while thinking about social protection policy is to figure out which gap is really binding. And you can imagine situations in which one of those four gaps, if it's really binding, it really creates a binding problem for the state or for the country. Now, when you have this, this, this myriad of, myriad of prog uh, programs, I said you need to have a policy, you need to have a framework. But how you go about it? And let me, let me give you a few examples from the world. So, I would say that two most popular approaches, I would call them one is layering and one is bundling. By layering, I mean that you divide your population into different groups depending on the income, and then you decide who receives what, you, you, you layer it. Example is Indonesia and Malawi are good examples, in which you have, in Indonesia, there is essentially poverty is bottom 10%, and the main Indonesian uh, uh, cash transfers program, which in their, the, in, in their case it is a, a conditional cash transfers named uh, PKH, covers 15% of the population, and those people receive cash transfers, they also receive food vouchers, and they receive also subsidization of social health insurance. If you then go up be, be, beyond this 15%, you go to the next 20%, they don't receive conditional cash transfers, but they do receive food subsidies and they do receive contribution to the health insurance. And then if you move further up to the aspiring middle class, they don't get any of the transfers or, or, or subsidies, but they still, uh, they don't get conditional cash transfers or um, food vouchers, but they do get subsidization of social health insurance. So you can see different layers, different levels of support, and it is very clear spelled out, stated, and policymakers know uh, what to do. The other approach is bundling, when you actually bundle services and then try to customize them depending on individual circumstances of a person. This is very challenging because for that you need very strong case management system and you need social workers that sit with people and decide what kind of a package is needed for them. Some people need you know, training. Others need just job counseling. Others may only need uh, transfer in kind. But it is all very much decided at the level of the, of, the, of the social worker, at the case management. And for that you really need decentralized programs with a strong local participation, developed caseware and social workers. And actually Latin American countries are famous for that because Chile Solidario, Costa Rica, uh, Puente, Colombia Unidos, or Bolsa Familia in Brazil now, now, now under a different name, they all have systems that are based on very very strong social workers, bundling services to individuals and customizing them. It seems to me, although I, am, I don't know enough about India to say that, but I think this, this decentralized approach with bundling is very much needed. I have a general sense, I already alluded to the similarity of programs in Delhi and Bihar, that uh, Indian social protection policy is overly centralized and case management system is not uh, properly developed. I have also uh, a lot of things to say about uh, the role of social registries, the role of delivery systems and uh, how, how interoperability is critical in order to have dynamic social registries. So whether you do layering or you do bundling, you need to have a system in which people are enrolled and disenrolled and this needs to happen in a dynamic way as opposed to based on surveys of census uh, sweeps. That's, uh, that's maybe a separate topic, Yamini, and I come back to that later in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think you lay out some very, very important elements uh, of uh, actually of what it is that, uh, that is needed to instill a sense of purpose. Um, the, the, uh, 
coverage, opportunity, flexibility, financing, back to decentralization. Um, but I see in this, Param, and I'm very keen to hear uh, your thoughts on this, a, a unique challenge for us in India. In a sense, if our starting point is instilling a sense of purpose, uh, the question is, do we have the administrative tools that enable that sense of purpose? If we just stay for a moment with these uh, four features, um, all of this requires an administrative architecture, and, and you know, again, building on what Neeti is doing with these state transformation plans, et cetera. It needs an administrative architecture that uh, absorbs feedback and that is able to pull that into uh, a sort of administrative scheme, because we do developments by schemes, in ways that are more responsive to the ground realities. But all our financing, and especially for social policy and social protection, is all dominated by centrally sponsored schemes. So are we, you know, on the one hand, we are saying to states, build these transformation plans, instill a sense of purpose, do this bottom up. But then, by the way, we've got tight funding that will come to you, and we will sit in Delhi and tell you whether or not you can buy a fire extinguisher for your school, regardless of whether you have a building. I mean, so how do we square these two complicated realities? Thanks. Look, uh, it, is a, <coughs> it is an issue. And uh, you're, I know you've been writing a lot about it, and others have as well. Uh, the one thing I think we need to recognize and acknowledge is the efficiency of the system has increased dramatically, right? So let's take even the centrally sponsored schemes. And, you know, without going back to that famous statement uh, many years ago about only 14 or 15 PESA reaching the beneficiary, now the whole digital transformation of India, whether it's Aadhaar or just financial inclusion, so I think, and DBT, Targeting beneficiaries who are, you know, recipients of schemes has significantly improved. So I think delivery has improved. Now the question is, in a centrally sponsored scheme, where, uh, again, you know, whether it's 60, 40, or 50, 50, or whatever, uh, these are schemes which have become more efficient. There were some 240 of them, I uh, was told recently by our DMEO team. But now I think they slowly, some of, many of them have either become dysfunctional or being phased out. Now, this obviously needs to be joint ownership. Now, many of these programs, you know, whether it's Swaj Bharat or Jal Jeevan Mission, the states are very much on board. This is what they want. So I think as long as there is a shared sense of purpose in terms of delivery of basic services to start with, where both benefit, both have a stake in it, and as long as it's efficiently delivered, now, you know, you can get into some political issues, they call it a different name because, they, you know, they have their own, uh, you know, they've got their own political goals. But I think if you look at the overall, the flows at least, it's become more efficient. I forget what is the total, some 8 lakh crores is spent on these schemes. And they, I think the idea is that they are jointly designed, they are made, uh, they benefit the state, they benefit the center, and therefore, you know, I think that there's been a huge improvement in the delivery of many of these basic services. Now, as you go forward in the whole spirit of cooperative federalism, you know, again, you know, the states have their own schemes as well. You know, many states are doing their own thing, like, for example, Meghala is not waiting for a centrally sponsored scheme. So I think there is joint ownership. Uh, I think we need to reach out more proactively to states from the center. And, you know, that's part of the role which Niti is seeking to, to, to play. And, you know, the Prime Minister has tasked us with uh, being much more proactive in terms of engaging with the Chief Ministers at a political level, at a civil service level, but also making sure that this is responding to demand from below. So I think this is a move which is, we are trying to take forward. But overall, it's got to be joint ownership and a joint sense of purpose. Sampath, just a very quick question to you on this, because while the schemes are a challenge uh, of uh, sort of at some level enabling purpose and simultaneously undermining purpose, there's also an element of what happens within the bureaucratic hierarchy, which in all of our work, the work I did with Shayana, with the post office state really highlights that particular point, that even in the internal hierarchy of how administrative is done in its day to day, the sense of purpose is instilled uh, not perhaps so much by the scheme as much as by the order that is received and the ability to respond to what the order of the 
it, they requires, and it, it has, so, part of it is about the IAS and its own internal hierarchies. Part of it is also about the state cadre, and we haven't really spoken about the state cadres when we speak about the people of the state. Uh, so just wanted your reflections on what will it take to shift this order-driven imagination of purpose. I will respond to the government order that comes to me in the morning, and as soon as I responded to it, the purpose of my day is over, and move it towards the purpose of my day is to ensure that, uh, you know, uh, safe drinking water is provided or there's good maternal care. So quick thoughts on that, and I'll come back to you in a moment. Yeah, just two things I would like to say based on your question. One is that, uh, um, the, the hierarchy, you know, how important is, uh, you know, to really, uh, I would say, the authorization, that model that I spoke is essentially about how to give uh, the power to the people. So, uh, especially whether, suppose, uh, if it is, uh, uh, our chief minister says very interestingly, he says that, you know, I have, uh, uh, a, just basically, I wanted this to happen, but I trust the team. I actually, I entrust the responsibility to them. So essentially that giving the work back to the people is a very, very important concept that I said, uh, the adaptive leadership framework. So we need to understand that like, I think there is a lot of changes required. In fact, one of my another colleague like Guljar, he also talks about this. Uh, we need to really, uh, you know, disrupt the hierarchy, you know, in a, in the, in a way that you know, it, it provides a positive results. So I think it requires a, a lot of, uh, 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 the reason why uh, this is important, the state level, state level leadership, especially state civil service of officials or the cutting edge level officials, they actually have uh, a more uh, permanent cadre in the sense like they, they stay there for a longer period. If you invest in them, it provides a tremendous results. So I think that's where uh, we are uh, looking at. In fact, when uh, this, when the when the authorization is given, and actually, especially when we use this approach of like you know problem-driven iterative adaptation approach, you know, asking them like you know to find solutions for the problems, and it gives automatically it gives a sense of agency. I think it, it's a process. That's why I said it is not. Through, it, it, it's a process. That's where we we worked, worked out. You know, we said like we require a, that kind of a, a three. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know the framework that I have given you, like like authorizing, and the champions. Like basically, champions needs to be authorized, you know, and then they have to be given the task, and then they have to be supported with the facilitating support. So I think if that happens, I think we can see phenomenal results. In fact, we can see some of the uh, you know uh, today actually for Meghalaya, we are more happy about the these leaders you know, who are coming up, especially from the state, especially at the cutting edge level. Um, I had a, you know, a follow up to the, uh, the, the point you made about bundling um, and how one thinks about this going forward. Because again, in the Meghalaya experience, from moving from, you know, focus on maternal deaths to comprehensive primary health care, it's a complex transformation to go from a single focused delivery to actually looking at what it takes to deliver comprehensive health. And I was just wondering how, you know, the experience of what it takes to bundle, right, to move from an individual goal, and as part of like mission to steady state, is also going from particular targets or focus to actually systemic delivery, which is actually more efficient, because we need to actually provide a whole series, and we're finding in Meghalaya people coming and talking about this a lot more, that it's not just maternal health state, it is a you know, community health uh, state and, and family health state. So I think that it would be really interesting to hear the kinds of changes that are required in the system as you move towards these kinds of shifts uh, in sectors. Um, and then I know we're short of time, so I'll add one which maybe everyone can think through is this, you, you mentioned very well the IITs and the IMs. And the interesting thing is we've been spending some time thinking about ITIs, I mean ATIs, you know, the administrative training institutes, and why we don't have a culture of public administration training that is different from management training or engineering training. It's not just, you know, the, actually, what would it take to galvanize these institutions as well? So let's we'll start with Meghalon. So um, thanks for coming back to, to bundling. What it takes are a few elements. First, I already talked about the importance of strong case management, strong social workers. But uh, there are a few other very important aspects uh, of that. First is 
increasingly the game is in the urban space and worldwide in Latin America where those bundling approaches are, are, are popular or Eastern Europe, that's increasingly the case in India. And it worries me that I see that urban sector is much less covered by social protection programs in India than, uh, than it should be. More than 50% of workers don't get any social protection program, whereas this is where the rubber hits the road, this is where the game shifts. So that's one important element to realize that, that we are going to urban spaces and realize that we are talking about mobile population that uh, can move in sometimes ve very quickly. The second element is that in the bundle I was talking about, a very important role is also played by social insurance mechanisms, sort of helping people ex ante before the risk occurs. And in India, all the centrally sponsored schemes and state level programs, there is a very strong bias towards protective mechanisms, basically helping people once the thing happened. Uh, for, for comparison, China itself has more than 20 social insurance schemes. So shifting it to social insurance is a part of the bundle which is of, which is of essence and um, in the in the, I already alluded to the huge challenge of covering the informal sector. I think too long we were all of the mindset that the world will be formalizing and that eventually those people will get, uh, you know, eight to five jobs will be covered by some kind of mandatory social security contributions. That ain't going to happen. Uh, India is as informal today as it was in the early 50s and it is not necessarily a curse. The point is how to increase productivity of the informal sector sector and how to deliver risk management mechanisms to those folks who remain informal. And risk management is social insurance. That needs to be a combination of incentive, of nudging, of voluntary savings, of flexible uh, possibilities to withdraw uh, the savings uh, in situations in which risk occur. So, so I think these are the, the key element is decentralization, going to the state and local level, developing social insurance, and going into the urban space. Uh, I think too much what, uh, what, what seems to me from what I see in India is one size fits all and it is increasingly it is increasingly irrelevant, I would put it this way. I also wanted Yamini to say, you talked about this cadre of uh, you know, administrative services and how they have a sense of purpose and uh, not just live in order to fulfill the orders they got from elsewhere. So I, I want to propose a very simple monitoring tool for every civil servant, which is to look back at your week and then to see how many meetings you had because you wanted them <laughs> as opposed the meetings because somebody called you for the meeting. <laughs> and believe me, it's a very simple indicator but very powerful. And the moment the number of meetings which you wanted falls below 50%, it is very dangerous. It means you are becoming a marionette, essentially acting on somebody else's direction, not a civil servant with a sense of, a sense of purpose. Shall we do that in the World Bank too? <laughs> oh, that will not look nice. <laughs> <laughs> too tempting. Sure, and uh, in, just to remind uh, Mikhail that there are uh, increasing number of pro social protection programs in urban, the PM Swanidhi, et cetera. So I think that's uh, we're beginning to recognize that. And you know, that's, that's a particular target group with the shifting population and so on, which definitely needs to be addressed. But coming back, a uh, couple of points here, and you spoke about, you know, are civil servants responding to government orders at the end of the day, and is that a sense of purpose? The other point which I wanted to state civil service is critical, right? And in fact, uh, the politicians depend much more upon them than upon the IAS officers who are sort of fleeting birds of passage who come to government of India and go back not so much anymore, unfortunately. But uh, so the capacity of uh, the state civil servants is absolutely critical. And I think there's an increasing recognition of that. And you know, you're seeing it in states like uh, Meghalaya, of course, but in other states as well. They're the guys who are there. They're the people who are on the spot. And even uh, not just in the IITs and IIMs, the state institutes of training, administration, the, you know, the, we used to have ours in Nenital, now it's in Lucknow in UP. So there's a lot of capacity development there, and they need to be involved as well in this entire transition of the states. But also just to respond, uh, 
you know, it, uh, Mikhail was talking about one size fits all. It, it, I don't think it's really like that, even though, you know, you might have the dominant image of the centrally sponsored. Every state is doing it its own way. And even in the support which we are trying to provide from NITI, it's about, you know, states, they want to do infrastructure. How does it fit into their goal? How do they raise resources? Health, education in the aspirational district program, it's all very tailored to local, not just state, but district and even below. Now, again, sometimes in mission mode, you can sort of, you know, try to lay out a blueprint and when you're pushing things along, you can go a little astray in terms of pushing it. But there's no question that it's got to be bottom-up, demand-led. It has to be ultimately owned, otherwise you cannot sustain it. And it is a bit of a trade-off, and I think that the balance, we are seeking to achieve that, and it's quite challenging. How do you get all states on board? How do you own? How do you come up with the joint vision? But I think it's, it's work in progress, and we're making some headway. Sorry, because we're just getting very close to uh, the end of the session, but uh, I, if we can just take maybe two comments from the audience, and then Sampath, uh, Param, and Mikhail, I'll bring you back for last uh, comments just to, yeah, so there's a hand up there, and I'll take one hand from this side, that right at the back. Uh, so those two comments, please yeah, I ahead. want to make one clarification, give one suggestion, and ask a question. Uh, you My, can only do one of the three, Raghu. Know, Sorry, yeah. there's time constraints. Uh, the clarification <laughs> is that Rajiv Gandhi never said that 85, 85 paisa was wasted. He was actually quoting from a planning commission report which said that administrative cost is 85% and 14% is the actual benefit, which makes sense. If you're delivering education, administrative cost is a salary that you paid which you would not say is a waste. So this is a one of the biggest enduring misinformation that has come down to us for decades, that uh, this 85% is supposed to mean corruption. It doesn't. <laughs> the second point, which is a suggestion, is you, uh, Mr. Ayer, mentioned that uh, we follow the PM, CM, DM model. How is it that states that do not follow this model have done much better than states that follow this model? Number two, we, we're constantly being told that we must give up our colonial legacy how is it that we hang on to an institution called the DM, which the British did not have, I mean, they had the good sense not to have it back in Britain, and they created it, purpose-built it for colonial administration, and we just hang on to it. So my suggestion to you is, take a state that follows the PM, DM, CM model, or whatever, divide it into two parts, run one part exactly as the constitution wants it to be run, Empower the Zilla Parishads, take the DMs out of the equation because they're anyway there for 18 months and then they go and they have thousands of committees to handle and all that they do is make PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> and then see how your programs are run after untied funds are given to the local governments. Create the incentive structure for the local governments to perform. And you don't have to do any training or anything. Just respond to their demands for capacity, which is not training, give them engineers, and give them people who can actually implement things on the ground. And let's compare the results. My Thanks. third, my question to Mr. Sampath Raghu, is, no, I, Sampath, I Sampath one, one point. <laughs> Mr. Sampath never, I wanted to know, what is the role of the Autonomous District Council in Meghalaya? Because the Autonomous District Councils are supposed to do everything that you are now doing through the state. In fact, if they were empowered well enough, there would be no need for a Meghalaya state and they are empowered by the constitution. Your presentation did not make any mention of the ADCs, so why don't you actually give the powers to the ADCs in accordance with the constitution and build their capacities instead of trying to centralize powers to yourself to an incapacitated state and then creating capacity for yourself. Thanks, thanks Raghu. Uh, there was a question at the back, uh, but if I can request you to please keep it short so we have uh, a few minutes for responses and last comments. Thank you. My question is uh, also to Mr. Sam uh, Mr. Uh, Sampath. Um, so it's very interesting to hear about your work in Meghalaya, especially around the fact that you're sort of centering the whole initiative on people and uh, really sort of uh, uh, talking about instilling a sense of purpose. I'm curious to learn about the sequencing of this reform. So where do you start to create this reform? Is it at the level of the authorizer? So do you sort of expand authorization at first, or is it at the level of the community? 
where you're trying to sort of instill this, you know, some some sort of like demand coming from them for greater uh, greater space to operate. Yeah, that'd be my question. Thanks. So maybe we'll start with you. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll take uh, the two questions. Uh, so one, uh, I think Raghunandan sir, I think uh, you were there in 2006 or seven, you know, visiting my district when I was DC. So, so <laughs> I know the ADC. So based on that, we found, we brought a, an adapt to model. This is again something I wanted to say. So DM, I, though actually, though I hail, you know, I also a member of Indian Administrative Service, DM or the DC still is the most credible organization in the country. You know, and so what is required is that we require an organization to convene people to facilitate the work. So I think that is the work that we are doing. Like, sir, actually what we have done is we brought village employment councils, a model where in, in a kind of a, in an autonomous districts uh, council, basically where the headman who is actually, is, uh, you know, authorized by the ADC, but the rest of the members are elected body like a modern, uh, you know, democratic principles. So we brought uh, something interesting model where our councils, like village health councils, where mother and father are male and female head of the households are the members of the village health council. And it is generally headed by the traditional headman. So we are using an adaptive model that works, you know, in the current context. Same is the case with the DCs also. Idea is that we are using the DC institution to empower the communities. The new age uh, alternate community institutions are like women's self-help groups or, you know, are the cooperatives. And, you know, I think maybe we need to really bring a lot of uh, work on those lines. So coming back to the, the question, I think the, uh, and I, I couldn't get your name, but that's a very good question. Definitely you require, it, it has to be started with authorizer. It is like, you know, I, I wanted to say, uh, Honorable Prime Minister said, like, you know, we wanted to get the uh, uh, Swachh Bharat mission. That's it, authorization. Once authorization is done, the champions can, you know, can start working on it. So it starts with authorizer, and then, of course, the uh, it requires a support system. It requires facilitators so parallelly, so that like the champions are supported, the state civil service officials, or the directors of the health service, or the DCs are properly supported in terms of like envisioning, like you know, understanding the problem, constructing and deconstructing the problem and finding local solutions to the local problems. The last point I wanted to make is one thing about the state capability. We have a tremendous knowledge. In fact, Raghunandan sir, I, we, went, we visited Kerala. That is one beautiful model, like, you know, uh, the uh, a model that one can actually learn a lot from there. Similarly, Tamil Nadu. So there is a cooperative federalism concept that actually, which has been brought again by the, the Honorable Prime Minister. I really wanted to say one thing about this particular part. We are actually today, we have actually signed an MOU with Tamil Nadu government to train our doctors because we don't have the capacity, we don't have the medical colleges. So, so it's a, a lot of capacity building can happen interstate. This is something that you know we I would like to uh, you know leave a thought between everyone along with uh, ATIs. ATIs are tremendous capacity. No, uh, good to know that Raghu is still holding us all to account. And <laughs> And glad to be corrected about what uh, Rajiv Gandhi actually said. But let me just, you know, I wanted to echo what uh, Sampath said. No question that I believe, and I don't know, uh, clearly you have a different opinion on the role of and the capacity of collectors, whatever you call the deputy commissioners, et cetera, to deliver. I think they still have, they play a very critical role in not just in administration, but in development. And even if you take the ZP model, in, whether it's in Karnataka or Maharashtra, it's a CEO plays a very critical role there, right? So it's good to have the elected uh, ZP, the CEO, the young IAS officer, the collector. I think they are, are fundamental to our development. And I think they will play a critical role in, in, in the years to come. Obviously, the role of the ZP or the block panchayat or the gram panchayat is increasingly becoming important. They're getting more empowered. Capacity is being built. I don't think it's an either or at all. So I just wanted to make that point. So maybe if I made two parting shots, uh, I got the point loud and clear about decentralization progressing, the increasing role of the state. I still would claim that a framework is needed 
that would guide uh, budgets and center state transfers mechanism in a clear and transparent way. And I think there is some way to go uh, f uh, in terms of developing this coordinated approach. And the second party shot, we didn't talk much about that, but uh, India is obviously a wonderful leader in leveraging technology to develop benefits. And it is seen at various levels. I think, however, that it is extremely important now to develop human resources to match this technology so that you can develop what I was talking about, bundling, case management, social workers responding to individualized needs of different, of different families. And uh, especially case management, I think, needs to be developed. Many countries re rely on case workers heavily. They are, they are the key elements of social policy making. And I think there is quite a long way to go, but there is a lot of energy here uh, about the state capability, so I'm sure India will get there soon. Thank you. Thank you so much to all three of you uh, for such an important session. In fact, we're going to take many of the themes that we've discussed straight into our next session with the Honorable Finance Minister of Andhra Pradesh, uh, who, is, who has just arrived. And uh, we'll, I think, be able to explore all these challenges, tensions, and possibilities from the perspective of a state uh, right after this. So please stay with us. We'll move seamlessly into the next session in a moment. But thanks very much. Really appreciate all your time.